Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. As most of you know, this week my mother passed away on her 95th year of life. Such a long time to live in this world, and yet historically such a short time. And the things that she saw and the things that she went through truly is an amazing thing that would startle the youth of today who know very little about history and about all the sorts of things that occurred in the 20th century in various countries. The first person that I buried when I was ordained was my own daughter, three days old. And in this situation, it was my mother of 95 years old. And you can see by this that <clears throat> our Lord Jesus Christ knows how and when to take the souls to Him on account of the fact that He knows the future as He knows the present and as He knows the past. As we even heard today in the reading where He knew the thoughts of the Jews who were trying to reason in their hearts that nobody can forgive sins except God. <clears throat> we know from the Gospel of St. John and from the Epistle that he writes that God is love. And such a love that we cannot imagine think of love in our human terms and we understand some small bit of it. But the love of God is so surpassing of all our own thoughts and our own feelings and our own understanding that it would seem that he takes the people to himself, so as to sort of optimize their life for him, if I could put it in any other ways. <coughs> and therefore, some people die early, some die in middle age, some die in late age. In any, in any case, only when it is to be to the best advantage to their soul and to the rest of the world, which we cannot comprehend. We cannot grasp this sort of great thing that the repose of one person somewhere in the world has a ripple effect through the rest of the world with all its different relationships and all and people's lives are changed histories are changed things are changed in families and in other places so much so even by the death of someone who you might think or the world thinks is insignificant to the Lord, nobody is insignificant. And even the so-called so lowest soul of all is worth more than the whole world put together. <clears throat> such is the love of God and such is the teaching of the Holy Orthodox faith. And this teaching today presents a barrier to those same people who reason in their hearts about Jesus Christ and his ability to forgive 
sins, to work miracles, to open the kingdom of heaven to them, and to do all manner of things for eternal life. Yes, indeed, there are the groups of people working against this. They want to destroy every church, and by that I mean every Orthodox Christian church, because only in the Orthodox Christian churches will you find the truth of things if you are willing to work at it. And hence is the sort of um, commandment that's put upon you for coming into the world. You have to work upon it. You have to do something for your soul at the expense of anything else. You know, today the temptation that Christ was one of the temptations that Christ was given on the mountain, the temptation of <clears throat> owning basically all the good things of the world, has so overtaken human <coughs> beings, even the innocent children which are barely beginning school, if you ask them what do they want to do in life, most of the answers are to make lots of money and have good cars and all these sorts of things. Such an enslavement to this demands its pound of flesh. By that we mean from the um, works of William Shakespeare that the person who is able to give these sorts of things to others <coughs> requires a payment back far in excess of that which is given and one which is painful even unto death. Already Already, many young people <clears throat> who have been baptised, chrismated into the Orthodox Church, don't go. They don't go on Sundays, they don't go on other days, and even the older ones don't. And when you explore why, they say, well, my career, I have to do something for my career. It's only for a short time. It's only for a short time. Once I've got where I want to go, everything will be all right then. And I will then go to church and do the things that are required. That second situation never comes. Once you are enslaved to those who promise you the world with things, they will never let you go to spend time on godly things. And therefore, if you want to be a true Christian, you have to learn from an early age This sacrifice that is demanded of us for those who want to enter the kingdom of God. And you know what? I've been through the corporate life. I've been through the industrial areas. I've been through the educational areas. And one thing I can see is that God is not mocked. Those who sacrifice and give up 
these so-called steps in their career and, work and whatnot in a miraculous and a wondrous way, sooner or later, get something back that's even better than what they expected. It's true. Get something better than is expected. And why shouldn't they? If God is love, and you sacrifice yourself in order to come to church, to help in the church, to work in the church and mainly to work upon yourself, then <coughs> it would indeed be a mockery if our Lord Jesus Christ did not respond to those sorts of things. Just as he responded in the reading that we had today where people ripped the roof apart to let down a sick person so that they, he could be cured. They didn't know whether Christ would cure him. They just didn't know. But with their faith they did it and it worked. And on most of the occasions that um, are mentioned in the Bible, these are the sorts of things that happen. <coughs> Even to those who are unthankful, as occurred when the ten lepers came, uh, the ten um, blind, I think they were, came, and one re and they were cured, and only one returned to give thanks. And the Lord said, "Well, what about the others? Where are they?" And still, out of His love, He let that happen did not do any harm to anybody. <clears throat> we sometimes think that God does harm to us or to the world or whatever. But when you look at it carefully, it turns out that this harm is purely the fabrication of human beings <coughs> who are not living according to to spiritual laws which exist exist and always have existed just as we have physical laws which exist you know physical laws you um, jump out of a window you hurt yourself you know, kill yourself maybe <coughs> a rock in the air, it comes back. Physical laws. But there are spiritual laws also. And when they are broken, there are consequences. When they are held, there are also consequences. One on the <coughs> negative side, one on the positive side. And that positive side is what we strive to achieve by being part of the church and by taking time out from our enslavement to the one who wants his pound of flesh. Say so no. Sunday, I am going somewhere else and I'm having nothing to do with your pound of flesh. And so, likewise, on feast days. Since I became ill, I haven't been able to do matins and vespers regularly. But does that stop you from coming here and doing it? It's what we call a lay person's service. Books are all there. We'll show you. Do them. Do the matins. Do the vespers. And I'll do my best to help and sit there in preparation for the liturgy on a Sunday morning. Because by right, according to the church canons and the church order, these sort of prayers require to be 
completed. <coughs> Not to satisfy the Lord, but to get your soul in order to accept Holy Communion and to understand what the feast day is. Who knows much about the feast day today? Who knows much about it? Gregory Palmer, in truth. Every year I talk about him. But who's actually read his material and tried to put it into practice? Who? Who knows his life? Who knows the great things that he did? How he essentially saved orthodoxy from the onslaught of the Roman heresy and from many other things. <clears throat> and how he taught ordinary people, ordinary people like us, how to get close to the Lord and even to obtain a glimpse of uncreated light that the Lord gives to those who love Him and work for Him. So is it so hard to have that faith to say no to those who are ready to cut your flesh out on Sundays and feast days and to come to church and to say to your careers, no, I have faith. God will give me a career. God will give me what I need in life. And I don't have to worry about that because it's going to happen in His time, in His way, and it's going to be in such an optimal way that I never even thought of this. I personally have experienced this and I've seen other people personally experience this in many different ways. <clears throat> and that's why we're here today, because the faith that we are supposed to have, which is able to move mountains, surely it could do such a small thing as to allow you to live a respectable life in this world which is falling to pieces. Why wouldn't the Lord, to those who are true in His church, the ones who are the only true ones, why wouldn't He give them a respectable life and respectability before all others, even if there's only one of them left? Why wouldn't he? He did it while he was on earth and walked on the earth. He did it with all the saints that came after and all the people that followed him. And likewise, he will continue to do that even when that Antichrist sits there on his throne. There will be others, true Orthodox, with true respectability, who will look at that Antichrist in his eyes and not be afraid of him at all because he can do nothing to hurt your soul. But on the contrary, only dig himself a bigger pit in everlasting torment, which is meant for him. That's the sort of thing that we need to be worried about in our life. What am I doing as a member of the church? Do I set aside time to pray, to read, to go to church? Or am I always saying, oh, just another week, just another week and, and then I'll get what I want and then I can go. And that other week never comes. Think about these sorts of things because they are so important in your life. 
And that is the thing you need to worry about, and not anything else. You don't have to worry whether the Third World War is going to come, or whether there's going to be a famine somewhere, or anything like this. God is not mocked, and to his true servants, he will provide. He will provide. He'll provide them his body, his blood, and all the things they need to live and that respectability which will show that yes, not only are they human but they also inherit part of divinity by being of the species of the God that we believe in. May God help us in these struggles struggles during Great Lent and after. <clears throat> and may we never forget that that's the only worry we need to have. Faith. Don't worry about anything else. Just worry about your faith. All else will be taken care of because to the Lord it's nothing to... Um, Cure a person, move a mountain, turn water into wine, raise the dead, or anything like that. It's nothing. The material world bows down before the Godhead. But we are the ones that have free will and need to use that free will in that faithful way so that <clears throat> we too may inherit part of the Lord's way and part of being the um, of being part of God. And just imagine the fantastic things that await for us. I always keep saying, I am in awe when I look at the sky at night and when I look at the photographs that have been taken by the very weak instruments that we have currently which can see beyond the planets and a bit further these incredible things which have been prepared for human beings for nobody else no other aliens no worms or creatures or cells that live in um, salty water or anything like that, but for human beings. And our Lord said that he goes to prepare a place for us and it's going to be such an incredible and um, fantastic place that those who have glimpsed it It's not. It's beyond that. We can't say it's wonderful. Because it's not. It's beyond that. There are no words to describe it. And that's why they keep silent, those who have seen these sorts of things. And therefore, you need not lament about anything in your life other than that one thing that you have the faith to see it through.